let's start with brief round of introduction of our presenters. Uh, Ray. Yeah, this is Fermon Cruz, uh, CTO of PlumGrid. Uh, we started PlumGrid a few years ago, three years ago to be exact. And um, before that, uh, I was working on network data centers and enterprise networks at a uh, previous networking company called Cisco. Uh, this is Joshua McKenty. I'm the CTO and co founder at Piston Cloud Computing. Um, before that, I ran an engineering team at NASA. Uh, that developed a popular open source cloud infrastructure framework called OpenStack. Can we talk, uh, we would like to know more about the OpenStack momentum. Uh, like, what's your perspective about OpenStack today? Uh, Bray, do you want to go first? Yes. So, we see, the net, we see the world from a networking point of view. So, OpenStack for us is a, is a market that is developing quite fast. What we see is that there's a significant transition where the the data centers and the clouds that are being designed uh, are going from more a traditionally virtualized data center to a cloud, where most of the, the transition is about automation, automation and a set of standard tools and frameworks that are being used. That, that Josh will comment more a bit about that. And from a networking point of view, what we see is that uh, there's two phases where people engage to us. One is uh, the customers that tend to be a little bit more savvy about networking and those uh, tend to engage with us up front and see how networking impacts into their cloud designs and into their data center designs. The other ones is the ones that they start by themselves, they grow a little bit, and then when they have scalability issues, uh, call us. So as, as Josh comments more on the open stack in general, what, what we see is this, is that the amount of customers that are calling us uh, for scalability issues on their, on their clusters or to start engaging in, in the design up front is increasing quite fast. And this is mainly driven by, by this necessity of automating and uh, kind of changing the culture of the way they manage their infrastructures. Yeah, Peter, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, on the OpenStack side, uh, or sort of more from the data center automation standpoint as opposed to just networking, um, we've seen, uh, can you flip to the next slide? Um, we've seen uh, OpenStack grow from a project with, with six or seven developers to something that, uh, as a foundation, now has over 17,000 members. Um, and uh, we do a user survey every six months to see sort of how is the community growing and what folks are doing. This really just represents um, folks directly engaged with the OpenStack development efforts and not folks that are uh, consuming um, products provided by some of the vendors in that ecosystem. But we see, you know, thousands of deployments of OpenStack around the world uh, and uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of servers. So when we started OpenStack, uh, we had no idea it would be this successful. But over the last couple of years, we've kind of retooled the mission statement to be uh, literally every server in the world. And I think we're, we're on track to achieve that. And obviously, Every server in the world uh, needs to be connected somehow to, to other things. So the network is really the most important part of the OpenStack effort going forward. Um, and, uh, you know, let's not lose track of, of the context of all of this. Certainly today's webinar, we're talking about going faster. Uh, we're talking about um, in the sort of new economy or the, the, uh, the data revolution or whatever you want to call it, um, being able to develop apps and go quickly from dev to test to staging to prod is the key competitive differentiation for most businesses today. Um, and being able to uh, automate the use of API-driven infrastructure is, is one of the key ingredients in going fast. Um, and so, uh, you know, storage and, and compute automation and virtualization have been uh, around for a while now and they're fairly mature. Um, but they're not really enough, and so we, we see the centerpiece of every OpenStack deployment really being, uh, how do you deal with SDN? And, and in there we see that uh, from a networking point of view, what happens is that is a field that over 20 years grew in, in, in terms of complexity. A lot of specialization came to exist in the sense that there were switching vendors, routing vendors, security vendors, and in security, you'd have further specialization, intrusion prevention, firewalls, VPNs, and you'd have load balancers, application load balancers. And somehow the expectations in IT departments was always that 
a team, a center, or somebody would essentially put an integration plan, and over six months they would make the network alive. And once you would have the network running, uh, it's something that you would keep alive for three, four years until you would come to the next design. So somehow it created a, a resistance to change, something that <coughs> you want to be stable, uh, you are very scared of the network going down because if uh, if a change in one of the elements in the router uh, propagates that information through routing protocols, the whole network goes down. So it created kind of a, a very uh, an environment that was uh, very slow to deploy uh, new applications and new new environments. Now uh, we fast forward 10 years, and what happened is that essentially the cloud revolution came, and now the private cloud and OpenStack uh, creating deployments in enterprises, and everything is about automation. And the question is, how do I tell you automate something when you have like five or six vendors with different type of APIs, things that are hard to prove that they interoperate together and so on. So what, what happened was that uh, from a networking point of view, when you were targeting these new cloud environments, a new approach was needed. And the approach was uh, the ability to create kind of a new environment, I mean, uh, being more towards the agile processes and the DevOps revolution, that rather than entering into the details of uh, why this specific router is important or why this specific protocol or switch or uh, load balance and so on. The idea was how do I create a networking infrastructure that integrates with my cloud and through automation through APS just works. And this was the notion of the need for a cloud networking suite. Uh, something that you install, you connect to Neutron or you connect to a cloud management system and it essentially as workloads get deployed and as Josh was saying as the automation towards compute and storage uh, happens, the network just follows. And this was not only the ability to essentially connect workloads, it was the ability to create uh, solutions around that. I mean, if you think uh, the cloud environment, the notion that now you can create hybrid clouds, disaster recovery environments that you can migrate workloads, uh, networking was always the pain there, in the sense that as network functions would be configured in the physical infrastructure, uh, they would be hard to move, hard to package in a way that you could move it into another site. So the idea was, how do you attach networking somehow to the workloads, to the storage, in a way that networking now becomes a soft concept, and we decouple the connectivity needs that you have in terms of packets moving from point A to point B, to the structure that you have to give to that networking layer in terms of security policies, addressing, and things like that, that networking would become something that could move with the applications. And this is kind of the, the topic for the discussion today is, how this uh, cloud networking and the automation gets attached into something that can fulfill the requirements of the new clouds. So I'm in an odd position with, uh, with SDN because um, when we started OpenStack, uh, we identified really quickly that software-defined networking was something we had to address. Uh, and I actually wrote one of the most widely deployed SDNs in the world, which is called NovaNet. Uh, and it's horrible. It's, it's uh, basically IP tables. Um, and so it's really interesting from my standpoint to see PlumGrid evolve into a position where uh, we can recommend it and, in fact, have a lot of joint customers with PlumGrid um, as something that does the set of things that we couldn't do with Nova Network. And, you know, the hard problems in SDN uh, have been hard problems in virtualizing infrastructure for years, as, as Perry pointed out, um, but we've really only gotten to a position where we could address them in the last uh, in the last couple of years. So that's that's really exciting for me, and I think quite timely. Um, and when you look again at not just uh, moving quickly during development, but uh, being able to manage the entire life cycle of applications with the same eye towards Agile development in the, in the sense of, of uh, continuously deploying um, and continuously delivering new functionality, uh, that agile network infrastructure is really the, the backbone of, of your ability to do this. And as I was saying, it was, it was nice to partner and work with Piston in the sense that they were one of the first ones to realize that uh, cloud was built not just uh, to deliver infrastructure as a service, there was the need of creating uh, a bondage with the applications that you built on top. So this one was one of the first uh, distributions to essentially realize that uh, partnerships with uh, Cloud Foundry, platform as a service, the ability to deliver uh, value on top of the cloud was a key. And this is where uh, business start tuning, tuning the stack in terms of storage, networking, and the compute aspect towards the specific use cases. 
And in that, it was nice to uh, participate with the effort and work with them because uh, sometimes from a networking point of view, we don't understand the pains that application uh, developers and application people experience when they deploy their environments. And as the automation goes beyond just compute networking and storage and it goes towards how do I scale my application? How do I create dynamic environments? Sometimes it's missed what are the networking implications to that scalability. So we had some uh, joint projects and, and it was very nice to see how uh, networking was breaking in a lot of times when applications would start to do interesting stuff. And this is where we started creating a tuned environment where Piston and PlumGrid uh, created an infrastructure that would adjust to the needs of applications sitting on top of OpenStack. And uh, it was nice to, the, the, the ability to basically fulfill uh, what we were saying before about the, the notion of a networking suite which would bring together the, from switching to routing to address management to DNS and floating APs and see how the whole thing tied together towards delivering what it reality matters, which is how do you enable an application to scale. And this is what sometimes gets lost when we talk about infrastructure as a service, that ultimately you don't build infrastructure as a service for the sake of it. You build it because you have dynamic applications that have to scale in your data center. And this is where uh, PlumGrid, uh, through the learnings, we evolved. I mean, we started the company being uh, kind of more a networking company. Uh, most of the DNA that we have in this company comes from uh, Cisco's and Juniper's and, and other companies that were focusing on networking. And it took a while to understand that uh, when you start shifting towards selling a networking solution, towards selling an integrated solution with a cloud management system, the point is not to have the best router, the best switch, the best load balancer, the best DHCP, the best DNS. The, the, the idea is that how do you create an automation framework that you provide all these things on top of any hardware in a way that is portable and it allows you to create these uh, solutions not only within a cloud but across clouds for hybrid, for disaster recovery and so on. So this is where the DNA of the, of the company started to shift towards not only creating a set of network functions but the ability to provide a comprehensive solution. And this is where we started engaging with uh, Piston and the requirements that they were coming to us was like, look, uh, uh, there's a lot of SDN companies in the market, a lot of SDN companies focusing on specific network functions. There's a lot of hardware vendors that now claim to have a solution that just to cloud. But in reality, what happens is that they tend to be very good at one element. And this doesn't mean that an application is going to work on top of that. So we started engaging uh, with Piston towards this project of creating a comprehensive networking suite. And this is where we started, driven by an application need, by the scalability needs of an application, go and revisit all the stacks and understand not only the network functions that we had to provide, but even the hooks towards the cloud infrastructure. And this is where we started with Neutron, understanding the limitations and the abilities of Neutron to express that value. And from there, we essentially uh, realized that uh, in some instances was enough, in some instances we needed to partner closely with, with uh, the OpenStack distribution in order to overcome those. Yeah. So apart from that, what we realized is that um, there were some intrinsic characteristics that the network had to offer. I mean, there were always two ways to solve the networking problem. One would be more from a physical point of view, like going to the top of the racks and the aggregation layer and so on. The other was to stay in the overlay. Uh, the decision for us was quite easy in the sense that most of the customers designing through clouds uh, with full automation, uh, the notion of manipulating the physical network was flawed. And was flawed in the sense that if for whatever reason you would have a mistake, the whole network would go down and the whole multi-tenancy aspect of cloud would fail. So the, the cloud model requires uh, a high availability aspect and this means that you have to compartmentalize each tenant in its own network environment. And this is where we introduced virtual domains, which is kind of a canvas where uh, each application, each project can live within its own network universe. And this was fully projected on top of an overlay with the ability to migrate across clouds. The second aspect was, of course, there were discussions about uh, how do you scale? How do you create an environment that uh, uh, network will not be the bottleneck for your workloads? And these tend to be real or tend to be true in physical networks. Uh, a lot of people, when it went to the virtual world, they started uh, thinking that service insertion and stitching network functions as VMs uh, or network nodes would solve the problem. 
Uh, that works at the beginning. That works when you have small cats. <coughs> but when you start growing your environments, when you start putting 500 virtual machines in a single uh, project, what happens to your network if your network has to be sent to a network node in OpenStack? So the, the second key pillar of what we are building was focus on scale. Because of that, we created an environment that all the network functions have to be fully distributed. Can I can I actually jump in and emphasize this point? Because this it drives me nuts when people talk about SDN and NFV um, and ignore this, which is, look, we demonstrated early on with OpenStack and, and using DevStack that inception is possible, right? That you can run OpenStack inside a VM. But we also acknowledge very publicly that it's a really stupid idea. It's great as a test bed, but... The, it, it, nesting capabilities of of infrastructure virtualization just leads to um, uh, performance problems, management headaches, orchestration headaches, etc. So, you know, we've always looked at the hypervisor as something that needs to run on the host, and the distributed storage fabric as being something that needs to run on the host. And frankly, key capabilities of the SDN controller need to run on the host as well. And this is one of the the real architectural advantages of PlumGrid is that the IO visor itself runs on every host. So we're not looking at routing traffic to some arbitrary VM upstream and bottlenecking an entire cloud environment on, on one VM, which, you know, I just see so many people draw their SDN diagrams without this idea of a scalable controller fabric and, and you draw, draw a set of packets and, and show me where the packets are going to go. And, and, and then explain to me how you're going to take, you know, 200 gigabits worth of traffic and cram it through one VM and back out again to your northbound interfaces. It's ridiculous. Yes, which, which maybe, George, maybe we can discuss a little bit about uh, why people think like that, right? And what we are seeing from a networking point of view is that uh, in traditional enterprises, there were always three departments, compute, storage, and networking, and they would take their independent uh, purchase decisions. What happened is that networking guys, they would understand their business. They would probably never accept that model. But on the other hand, they were extremely slow to adopt change. Mm -hmm. Then you would have more the sysadmins, compute guys, that they would uh, need the agility of somebody providing infrastructure fast, but they may not have a full understanding of what happens with packet losses and bottlenecks and so on. So we, we were discussing about the, the why uh, sometimes uh, networking is designed in a way that appears to work, but then it doesn't scale, and why uh, certain solutions are needed. And uh, we were discussing with Josh on how do we track it to the changes that are happening into the enterprises in terms of team reorganizations and moving from these silos that uh, compute, networking, and storage departments are changing towards these cloud groups, and what is the effect on that? And what we are experiencing, at least from a networking point of view, is that uh, the networking departments are getting more and more siloed towards maintaining the physical infrastructure, but the physical infrastructure tends to be just for connectivity, just to provide from server to server connectivity, layer two, layer three, depending on what design they choose. And the network functions in terms of how to provide a solution for those clouds tend to go more towards the cloud designers, the cloud architects, and the cloud people, and those uh, Essentially, they are more used to the notion of, can I try this tool and does it work? And uh, maybe less trying to spend time in terms of bringing a network design for the next six months that makes sense. But what do you see, Josh, from, from the customers that you're addressing? Is it still like the three pillars of infrastructure or is it a new bit of uh, environments that you're serving? Well, uh, I think what's really interesting is it's, it's, it's not one or the other, it's both. You know, and especially on the network side, Yes, we see the rise of DevOps or the fact that the operational controls are more and more vested into the development team. So responsibility for design and provisioning of the network and the storage and the compute resources rests directly in the development team. But the operational management uh, still rests with the traditional network administrators. And so uh, although they've lost control over designing the network, they've somehow retained the responsibility for performance and availability. Um, and it's it's almost the worst of both worlds. It used to be that you could overbuild, you could design and overbuild the network to, to meet the requirements of an app that was poorly designed. And then at the very least, you could meet your QoS guarantees. Uh, now the design of the application networking is, is in the development team. Um, and, you know, I don't mean to be little developers because I am one, but, uh, Developers barely understand compute cycles. 
they have a very limited idea of how storage works, except that it's something you save files to, and they don't understand packets at all. And so I think that the challenge with a lot of these SDN architectures is that they were dreamed up by by developers instead of by network engineers who just figured that somewhere in your cloud you have a connection between your virtual network and the physical network, uh, and that's good enough. And they don't really think through, okay, well, how many packets are going through what physical interface at what rate, and where are the headers being stripped off and where are the headers being added. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I think the – look, the only reason we knew this going into Piston is because we we lived through it at NASA. When we stood up NASA Nebula, we did the same thing as everyone else. We started out with just a couple of dedicated network nodes, um, and they were a huge bottleneck on, on northbound traffic. And uh, we used traditional VLANs, um, which was a huge bottleneck on um, – uh, on orchestration of, of provisioning. So it took us literally days or weeks to set up new virtual networks. And so we had a really visceral, personal experience with the problems of some of these traditional architectures. And so what's surprising to me, looking at a lot of the, the newer SDN options, um, excluding PlumGrid, obviously, from this list, is is that they're, they're, they're built around an architecture that I think if you tried them for 20 minutes, you would realize why it was flawed. Um, and yet folks just, and I think this is the, the paradigm of, oh, well, it worked in my test bed. You know, there's actually a t-shirt for this in the OpenStack community. It says, well, it worked in DevStack, right? And I think this is a lot of, a lot of this idea of, well, it worked on, on a single server cloud. That's not a cloud. You're not actually testing any of, any of the hard parts, which is why, although it's been a challenge for us from a go-to-market standpoint, at Piston, we've never certified a POC with less than five servers. Because you can't even tell if it's working or not without at least a quorum of, of hardware. Mm -hmm. And this is when, at Plumgrid, we approach the problem in a different way. Um, if you think networking has been kind of this uh, network spaghetti design that you attach uh, a network element followed by another one, followed by another one, and this is how the physical world was working. Uh, when we started thinking, uh, what kind of network services do we have to provide to workloads, uh, to applications? Uh, one approach would have been, do we just provide a distributed virtual switch? And there were companies that were doing that. Do we just provide a distributed router? Uh, but the idea was, like, if we just go towards the network functions, uh, that may not be uh, the right approach because, because we just uh, uh, continue the design of interfacing the virtual with the physical following uh, network functions. What we said is that what's missing is something more fundamental. It's an operational construct. I mean, networking cannot be seen anymore as a bunch of uh, machines or network elements connected together. Uh, there had to be some abstraction that was missing. And we look back towards what happened when uh, VMware introduced virtualization, for example, for the virtual machines. And a lot of people think that uh, the innovation or the value that virtualization brought was this notion of server consolidation. The fact that now instead of buying more physical servers, they could use per cycles uh, using VMs. But it was more subtle than that. The notion of virtual machine was not only a virtual server, was new management models that they didn't exist before. With a virtual machine, I could essentially clone a virtual machine. How could I clone a physical server? There's no way to clone a physical server. How could I migrate a virtual machine to a disaster recovery location? How could I snapshot it? How could I pause it? So essentially, a virtual machine was much more than just an abstraction of compute to server consolidation. Was a new set of operational models that led towards this automation revolution. So when we approach networking, we're saying, well, we cannot just approach it as everybody else. We cannot just deliver network functions. We have to bring this abstraction that is missing in networking. And what we created was the virtual domain. And the virtual domain is an operational construct that you say, well, uh, I create an application, and as Josh was saying before, uh, how do we migrate an application from development to testing to integration to production? We said, well, you create a virtual domain, and this operational construct of a virtual domain, you can clone it. You can migrate it. You can snapshot it. You can bring it down. You can destroy it in a way that when you define the network topology inside a virtual domain, that has this envelope that you can control. And this was the first element that was missing in networking in order to deliver this agility, this automation that uh, the cloud world requires. 
Then the second was, okay, so what networking model do you put inside the virtual domain? And here is where now we are in the middle of a transition with all the things going on about policies versus topologies versus uh, open flows and things like that. Uh, the network industry is a bit confused in the sense that you have a huge uh, uh, expertise and CCAEs and an understanding in terms of how networking should be designed in terms of topologies and network elements. And now you have a new breed of network developers and network engineers that understand a new world, which is a policy-based universe. So at PlumGrid, what we were saying is like, uh, when we started three years ago, we were saying, well, we, we don't know. We don't know what's the future going to deserve, uh, uh, bring to us, but uh, whatever brings, the virtual domain has to be able to support both. So we spend quite a bit of time with, with our customers and the notion of uh, policy-defined networks uh, three years ago there were just a few customers that could understand it, but there was a strong resistance in terms of uh, what are the operational tools to troubleshoot a policy-based network? What are the monitoring events that they have to take care of? How do I understand when the packet gets dropped? How do I track it to the policy that was defined? So we started introducing the notion of uh, topologies, but always knowing that whatever you express in a virtual domain is an abstract concept because this abstract concept gets projected within a cloud. So now, what we have created is this virtual domain uh, concept with the ability to create uh, network functions and network elements that satisfy the open stack needs, but it's kind of future-proofed uh, in terms of how to define policies. And the first thing that we've done is we've integrated this policy framework with the open stack policies uh, as needed, but in reality, it's kind of more fundamental. It kind of provides these two paths. Once we had this virtual domain and the network function, essentially uh, we started working with Piston with some customers about uh, what other things are needed uh, beyond what the projects or what the tenants on top of this cloud uh, see. And this was when we embark uh, uh, within a project with Piston on how do we secure a cloud. And security is a big uh, topic in the sense that it goes from how do we make sure that the BIOS of a computer are uh, secure? How does the hypervisor boot in a secure way? how does the project or the network uh, gets created and how the packets are exchanged uh, in a secure way. So maybe maybe we can talk a little bit more about the journey about security in general. Sure. But it's, it's a complex topic that uh, it requires this holistic integration between the two companies working towards a specific goal, especially because uh, the clouds that we started developing with for some of our customers were way more than just running uh, disposable virtual machines. We're supposed to run uh, projects that uh, uh, the customers that were sitting on top had specific requirements in terms of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one of the things that, that that has dovetailed really nicely between uh, Pistons architecture, which is, you know, what we consider to be hyper-converged, where um, we use commodity hardware for, for all of the services and we run all of the services on all of the nodes, um, and, and the plum grid architecture is the relationship between availability and security. And, you know, look, clouds are distributed systems, right, which means the hard thing about a cloud is not running a collection of services. It's, it's running a collection of services in uh, an HA fashion. Um, and so we've always taken this, this approach of owning all of the hardware in the cloud from the bare metal up and not being uh, an application that runs on top of an OS that's configured in some traditional fashion. Um, uh, which means we actually uh, we deal with uh, powering on every server as well as uh, using IPMI um, to to configure them. What falls out of this is, in order to manage um, a highly available cluster, we have to be able to turn servers off and disconnect them from the network if they're in an unknown state. Right? This is this is uh, what used to be called stoneness in in old school HA. Um, and so we manage the entire cluster of, of servers uh, as a distributed system by, by orchestrating what gets powered on, what gets powered off, what gets connected to the network. And using an SDN as part of the solution means that some of your security capabilities fall out of this quite naturally. If you have an unknown or um, uh, potentially hostile device in your cluster, the right response is to disconnect it from the network and power it off. Um, and those two capabilities, we've already guaranteed that we have for every server in that cluster because that's also how we manage upgrades in HA. 
Um, so I think these, these two architectural components fit really well between Piston and Plum Grid um, and, and give us the, the sort of the, the building blocks for how we address security above that. And from a network point of view, of course, there's always been the fears of the man in the middle attack. And the idea is that uh, providing isolation just based on uh, encapsulating traffic with specific labels and be able to track it was not enough. I mean, this is how the networking industry has been worked with the notion of villains or tags or MPLS labels, you name it. There's been multiple virtualization techniques in the physical world. But the fact that the cloud was in nature multi-tenant and uh, running workloads from different customers that they may be competitors or there may be a hostile entity trying to just place workloads in the cloud uh, to maybe uh, understand what was going on, on on the other tenants. It required a much more strict uh, security model. And uh, some of the designs started by uh, focusing, of course, data at rest. I mean, the notion that uh, all the storage should be encrypted in a way that if somebody for whatever reason, uh, pierces through a hypervisor, then at least the data would not uh, be available. But then there was the notion of what happens at data traffic, basically data in flight. And uh, the requirement that came to us, and, and it made a lot of sense, was what if uh, all the traffic would be encrypted? Coming from the hypervisor, encrypted right away at the source, uh, go through the fabric until the destination endpoint that would have the VMs or the workloads uh, relevant to that specific tenant. And this is what we introduced uh, with Piston, the ability to essentially create this encrypted network traffic, encrypted virtual domains, that would prevent uh, somebody sniffing at the fabric at the physical level to understand what the workload, what the application was doing. And uh, as you see, there's, there's a pattern. I mean, there's always the set of applications and network functions that get delivered towards uh, satisfying the application that runs on the cloud. And then there's another set of functions that satisfy the needs of the cloud owner, the administrator of the cloud. And this, uh, on the application side, of course, the discussions tend to be more about uh, do we support uh, switching, routing, address management, floating IPs, load balancing, things like that, which they are the building blocks that you use to design uh, the blueprints for your applications. And then the other set of uh, functionality that we started introducing from the notion of virtual domains, creating templates for them, migrating them, encrypting them was more satisfying of what kind of SLA does the cloud provider wants to provide to their tenants. And this is the, the effort that we started with Piston was this, is to focus on not only what APIs and what uh, infrastructure do you provide to the users of the cloud, but what kind of facilities do you provide to the owner of the cloud. And this is what essentially makes the difference between uh, being kind of a, a, a POC or a prototype cloud versus a cloud that you can rely to create uh, a reliable service on top of it. And as, as Josh was mentioning before, there's always the high availability and the security as being kind of the main SLAs missing in cloud today. And uh, the notion that uh, the full spectrum of HA and security elements that have to be delivered in a cloud is, is a complex element that requires the two companies to work together. So the, the other aspect that we, we touch uh, upon uh, with our customers was this notion that um, as we go into this transition of, of what does it mean networking into a, a cloud environment. And the, the discussion becomes quite complex because there's, as we were saying, the notion of what network functions, what uh, blueprints, what designs does your application need. But not only that is what kind of elements uh, as an operator you need to bring up a cloud. So at PlumGrip, we, we decided to approach the problem uh, holistically. We said, we are going to help our customers uh, to engage from the beginning and realize that when you design a cloud, if you carry some of the legacy thinking in terms of uh, layer two networks, spanning tree, and some of the complexities uh, with VLANs uh, that people are used to have in the virtualized data center, when you would carry those into cloud, sometimes they create problems. And the reason why we had this legacy construct was essentially because we had uh, virtualization, we had VMs, VMs wanted to move around, but they were bound by the network uh, uh, in terms of a broadcast domain, in terms of a villain, in terms of a layer two environment. When we go to cloud, this is not acceptable anymore because clouds scale. They go beyond a single rack. They go across multiple racks. They may even go across multiple locations. And the idea was how do we engage from the beginning, from the design phases to help our customers uh, to deliver a solution that uh, 
uh, isolates you from these dependencies. And this would be what, what we call the design phase. Then the boot phase is an interesting one that uh, it's when a, a cloud gets deployed. A lot of times uh, uh, cloud uh, gets installed and still the, the fact that you interact with physical aspects of your network in terms of the, the top of the rack, the legacy networks and so on, it creates some friction. And because there was kind of a lack of understanding of what does it mean this virtual network infrastructure wall and how it interoperates with the physical wall, uh, we engage on that phase to help our customers to jumpstart the cloud. Then, of course, the, the use aspect is, is fully automated. That part has to be completely uh, driven by APIs, orchestration frameworks, uh, service deployment models, and this is the full automated aspect of cloud. And then, of course, there is the other aspect of uh, now, how do you operate, how do you troubleshoot, how do you maintain, and how do you upgrade? And this is where with Piston we found a quite nice synergy because there was always this notion of uh, how do you provision, deploy a network infrastructure and a compute infrastructure, and how do you upgrade it? And with the notion of uh, the Piston deployment model uh, that essentially delivers uh, the, the compute as a pixie would essentially like jumpstart the cloud by having a, a Put node, essentially a source of truth that delivers the functionality and just uh, treat the hardware and let the hardware pull whatever is needed. Uh, it's where we started driving this integration where the operational aspects <coughs> and the maintenance aspects of a cloud became much simpler. Maybe, Josh, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, this, this really evolved out of uh, earlier work um, managing and deploying some of the first OpenStack clouds, which is... Um, I don't I don't trust configuration management, you know, and I stopped I stopped trusting it after having uh used it quite extensively. You know, we built the first uh puppet and then the first chef recipes for, for deploying OpenStack. And um patching is a nightmare. Uh and, and it's unreliable and it leaves systems in, in uncertain state. And so the idea of never patching or in fact never even installing an operating system on physical hardware and always net booting into a RAM disk uh, was sort of the centerpiece of the, the piston deployment model. Um, and the advantage of doing this is uh, we know what the state of, of the cluster is at any point, and um, we also know the version of every piece of software that's deployed. And so when we're scaling out a physical environment or scaling in a physical environment or, or orchestrating a rolling upgrade, um, the mechanisms are always the same. We, we use a, a distributed state machine to keep track of all of the various services. We migrate those services between hosts, uh, and we reboot hosts to, to bring up uh, new software updates. Um, and we do this to manage the SDN components, the SDS components, the hypervisor, the various OpenStack services, uh, uh, the, the customer integrations with authentication systems and monitoring systems. Everything is dealt with in the same way, um, and none of it is is spackled, to to borrow a term from from Pivotal, uh, by by operators at runtime. So it gives us a really deterministic view of of the physical cluster, um, and I don't I don't know of another way to manage OpenStack at any reasonable scale. Um, the the advantage with this approach really um, is uh, the, the, the users are left dealing with their applications, uh, and the infrastructure can really be treated as uh, a fully automated environment. Um, and in the same sense that, uh, you know, the storage is all provided by a distributed storage fabric, and the users are really dealing with virtualized storage, they're also dealing with virtualized networks, and the physical network is not something that they're concerning themselves with. Um, and obviously, this model only works if you have uh, a great distributed storage solution and a great SDN solution and a powerful hypervisor. And so we were really careful in selection of all of those components. Um, you know, KVM out of the box doesn't have strong enough live migration to, to be able to orchestrate this sort of system. So we've, we've got commercial extensions to KVM. Um, Ceph was a great choice for a distributed software fabric, storage fabric, um, but we've extended Ceph with a set of storage policies that allow us to manage multi-tier uh, and also separate ephemeral storage from durable storage. And then finally, PlumGrid 
is one of the only SDN choices that really allows us to expose the, the breadth of networking options required for, for applications. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, nobody's deploying OpenStack because they want OpenStack. They're deploying OpenStack because they have uh, a need to, to build applications on top of it. Um, so most of our customers are using Cloud Foundry or Service Mesh plus Cloud Foundry or Farm Boy or some set of PaaS tools above the OpenStack APIs. Um, and the real test of the components that were selected to, to power those OpenStack APIs comes when you look at the consumption of those um, at, at, a, at a higher level of the stack. So guys, uh, we are almost at the end of the webinar. Uh, we have got a few questions here uh, from the audience and uh, I would like to take the first question. Uh, it's about uh, want to understand the benefit of plum grid versus neutron capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, analogous to Swift versus Swift, Ceph versus Swift plus Cinder. So can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, Neutron today is, a, let's call it a, an API proxy layer with a state on it that allows different vendors to plug uh, their solutions. If you think there's an OpenStack uh, version with OBS, an OBS controller, but uh, somehow it has a lot of limitations as we discussed before in terms of uh, how do I provide additional functionality beyond, let's say, switching, uh, where do I run my routing elements or my NAT elements or my firewall elements with the notion of network nodes. So, uh, even if uh, Neutron plus whatever available solution it's uh, from the open source uh, provides the functionality in order to kind of demonstrate the use of cloud and networking, uh, there's no uh, scalable, secure, comprehensive networking suite behind Neutron. And this is where then uh, Neutron becomes as a placeholder where multiple vendors uh, cooperate or argue or fight, whatever you want to call it, in order to deliver a solution. Uh, within Neutron, you have two ways to, to insert uh, a networking solution. One would be as a plugin, the other is an ML2 driver. Depending on your capabilities in terms of what network functions you offer, you have uh, different ways to insert that. But you should not see Neutron as a, as a network provider. Neutron is just an entry point or an access layer, an access API to the networking uh, solution that you may choose. And PlumGrid is uh, one of the solutions, uh, arguably, I mean, here I'll say the best solution, <laughs> but uh, essentially you have to differentiate Neutron as the way to access a networking solution and the solution is behind. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, a, a great articulation. I, th I think Neutron of all of the OpenStack projects is the most misunderstood in this regard, you know, and uh, it's always been clear uh, in the Nova project that Nova was intended as the interface layer and the scheduler above whatever hypervisor you wanted to use. You know, we've supported all of the major hypervisors since very early on in the project. Um, but there's no hypervisor as part of Nova. You know, and the same is true uh, to a greater or lesser extent with Cinder. Cinder is intended to be the abstraction above block storage. Uh, there are lots of Cinder drivers. Um, there's effectively no real Cinder driver, in, no no real driver in the Cinder project, um, and the, the driver that's there is intended as a placeholder only. Um, and I think that Neutron should be considered the same thing. The, the the OVS driver in Neutron should be considered a placeholder, not not a real network driver. And there are a number of of real network drivers available. Um, and I would say, you know, frankly, we have more customers using PlumGrid than anything else. So certainly that's that's a strong testament to its capabilities. So next question I have is uh, how Piston enables the application infrastructure integration to the SDN layer? Uh, yeah, so this question comes up a lot in the sense of Cloud Foundry specifically. Um, when you think about uh, applications or, or, uh, or let's say the pass as a great example of a typical application on top of OpenStack, um, what capabilities do they really need from the network? Uh, you know, obviously, basic layer two, layer three functionality is in there. Um, floating IPs are, are clearly required. Security groups are clearly uh, required. But, um, you know, <laughs> ironically, most of the SDN vendors have focused on a set of layer four through seven functionality that the apps don't really need yet. 
Um, and they haven't finished the basic layer two and layer three functionality. And this is this is sort of the the, the thing I, I I would echo Perry's earlier comment is um, a, a meaningful a cloud ready SDN needs to have breadth. You know, we why would we partner with someone who had a a great firewall as a service layer when they didn't really have strong you know basic layer two and layer three networking and certainly you know, security, quality of service, and HA are those those first fundamental capabilities. Um, so I think there's a lot more we can do uh, in terms of extending how Cloud Foundry and Bosch and other components talk to um, the SDN layer. Uh, some of that, I think, can be done through Neutron. Some of it, I think, can be done through the Neutron Extensions API. Um, some of it, I think, will take collaboration between the Cloud Foundry community um, and the Neutron community and some of these key SDN vendors like, like PlumGrid. Okay. Uh, another question which we have got is, does PlumGrid benefit from the automation features of Piston or is such integration planned? Of course. I mean, the question is more, uh, do you have a cloud without automation? <laughs> so I would, I would frame it in a different way. It's not that we benefit from the automation capabilities of Piston, it's that the end customer benefits from the combination of this automation solution. So the goal of automation is not just to uh, one grid or Piston benefit one of each other. In reality, it's like to deliver a, a value to the end user that uh, you can create self-serving portals, elastic applications, applications that drive themselves as we are discussing right now with Bosch and, and Cloud Foundry. And the idea is how do you create uh, these environments in enterprises, private and public clouds, that they just work and they don't need human intervention. That, I would say, is the benefit of the integration. I mean, I, I can put a more technical answer to that as well. The, the Plum Grid IOVisor uh, runs on every host in a Piston cloud, um, and it's deployed there as part of Piston OpenStack using a Moxie job so that it's upgraded in place using the Piston upgrade process as well. So yeah, the the, the orchestration of, of uh, Plum Grid in a Piston environment is, is using the same set of capabilities as orchestration of OpenStack and Ceph and all of the other components of your cluster. Okay. Uh, so guys, we are running out of time here. Um, we'll take one more question, uh, but that's pretty much it. Any additional questions can be sent to events at the rate of plumgrid.com? or uh, the questions which haven't been answered on the uh, webinar right now, uh, but have been asked in the panel. Uh, we will be posting a Q&A by next week to answer all those questions. So the last question I have right now to answer is, how do you support traditional networking administrator model here? Yes. So, so more than traditional administrator model was, how do you uh, create a networking model in this virtual world that whoever has to maintain it feels comfortable? And as we were discussing before, the, the expertise is shifting more from understanding how to troubleshoot uh, switches, routers, and firewalls, and so on, to maybe in the future other models. But still, today, the bulk of the understanding of how networking works is basically with this topological understanding. So what we offer uh, is a fully automated environment uh, with a Piston and OpenStack in a way that you can create your uh, networking needs uh, through APIs. But at the same time, what we have is, is a new, another way through a user interface or through a APIs that you can go and troubleshoot and debug and understand what's going on in the network. Because sometimes people need to understand why applications are slow or why packets are being dropped. So we offer this uh, way of seeing a networking in a more traditional way to smooth out this transition for network administrators from uh, the way networking is understood to the way the work network is, is managed and automated. And this is uh, what we call kind of this dual mode of operations that we have in the virtual domains. One is that the full automation through APIs and integration with OpenStack. The other is the, the ability to debug and troubleshoot uh, the virtual topology as if it was a, a real one. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, sure. uh, yeah. Thanks for your time. I hope it was informative for everyone, and uh, we'll be answering more questions. And feel free to reach. Uh, a plum grid or piston team if you have any questions or are you uh, evaluating anything in regards to uh, the open stack or uh, or just your software defined data center uh, this recording is uh, this
webinar is recorded and uh, will be posted on both the websites so that if you want to listen to it or uh, have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.